Martha is serving and Mary is still worshiping. And yet this time Martha does so with a proper understanding of her priorities. One of the things we need to understand is that service is always an expression of your worship. It always will be and always has been. Service is going to always be an expression of your worship because what you worship, you will serve. Whatever it is that you worship is going to take the premier center of your life. Whatever you worship, you will serve. How do we know that? Well, in Luke, in chapter 4, we have the temptation that Jesus Christ endured. And, and in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, Luke records that the devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Worship and service are tied together because what you worship, you will serve. Satan wanted Jesus to worship Him. But Satan knew that should Jesus give Him worship, Jesus would end up serving Him. So worship of God will always be expressed through service to God and to man. Because Christian faith is expressed by actions, and if it is not expressed by actions, if it is not expressed by, by good works, then it's not genuine. James tells us in chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. And so we have the said faith, and we have the head faith. You can say I've got faith, and you can have intellectual knowledge of things and say that you have faith. But we're talking about a working faith, a practical faith, a serving faith. And that's what we see here in the life of Mary. Mary is somebody who is a true worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice in verse 3 how it says that Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And so Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Spikenard was an aromatic herb imported from Arabia, India, and the Far East. It is said that it was the costliest anointing oil of antiquity and was sold throughout the Roman Empire where it demanded a price that put it beyond any but the wealthy. And so Mary is bringing a flask of this spikenard. It contains 12 ounces in order that she might anoint the Lord Jesus Christ. And in an act of worship, she poured out this very costly perfume upon his head. Now, when you combine this passage, chapter 12, verse 3, with Mark, chapter 14, verse 3, you see that she anointed first his head and then she anointed his feet. She came up from behind as he reclined, poured it on his head, and then she anointed his feet. And the anointing of the head was a distinction conferred upon the guest of honor. And that's what she's doing. She is, she is at this point, she is giving to him a sense of his importance. It's possible that she understood the nearness of his death because Jesus, in verse 7, says, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. It's possible that she understood the nearness of his death. She more than likely saw what his beloved disciples refused to see. You see, the disciples didn't want to embrace the fact that Jesus was about to die. When Jesus would speak to him concerning his death, oftentimes they didn't want to hear what he had to say. A good examples found in, in Matthew 16, 21 and 22. Because there it says, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. They resisted the idea that Jesus would lay his life down. They resisted that, but Mary did not. Mary accepted what the others could not receive. And so she takes a very costly oil of spikenard and anoints the feet of Jesus Christ. What we're seeing here is an act of sincere worship. Again, love for Jesus will always be revealed by actions. And as we see her action, we can use her as a model of worship. Her worship is an expression of love for Christ that we can learn from. And as we look at this, I want to take some time to, to examine some of the elements of worshipful giving to the Lord because that's what we see taking place here. And I want to share with you some things about giving to the Lord in the way that she did. The first thing, though, I want to note with you is this. Worship is acceptable to God when it is directed to Jesus Christ and not anyone else. 
Worship that is acceptable to God is directed to Jesus Christ. Notice with me, Mary didn't anoint the disciples' feet. She anointed the feet of Jesus Christ. That's because he was the one giving up his life for the salvation of the world. Jesus in John 14, 6 says, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to my Father but by me. And so in her worship, she's worshiping Jesus. So the first thing I see about worship is that which is acceptable to God, that which is true worship, comes through Jesus Christ. But a second thing I see, and that is true worship of God, always involves willing sacrifice. Now the Bible tells us here that she took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. That word pound is in reference to a measurement that was used by the Romans. The word is litra. It speaks of 12 ounces. And so she brings 12 ounces of very costly oil of spikenard. Now, verse 5 tells us the value of it. 300 denarii. Now, obviously, you didn't pull a check this week from your work and get paid in denarii. So what's a denarii? A denarii it was equivalent to one day's wage. So what we have here is a gift that she is giving to Jesus that was worth 300 days wages or a year's wages. And so that tells me her gift is very expensive. But it was worth it to her because she loved him. And so practically speaking, what you value, you sacrifice for. Bottom line, we already know that. What I want, I'm willing to do almost anything for. I'll give up my time and I'll give up my money for it because I want it that bad. There are a lot of people who, who value things that they're willing to, to give up a lot of time and in, in, in even sometimes a lot of money for. You know, a movie comes out recently, The Dark Knight comes out, that's a Batman movie, and a lot of people wanted to go see it, so they stood in line. We know that. They stand in line sometimes, perhaps you did, stand in line sometimes for an hour, two hours, three hours, five hours. Some people will get there late at night to be the first ones in and everything because they want to see this movie. What you want, you're going you're gonna to sacrifice for. Some people do the same thing for concerts. They'll stand in line or, or be seated in line for, you know, for some time, you know, overnight, two days sometimes, so they can get tickets to go and see their favorite musician. Or they'll go in front of uh, some electronics store and, and they'll wait to get the Wii or whatever because they're, they want that as badly as as anything they'll stand in line to get into restaurants they they'll stand in line to get into a sporting event uh, they'll stand in line to to get a glimpse of their favorite movie stars some people recently stood in line for several hours so that they might get the latest iphone you know and it amazes me marie and i were at a shopping center and we were walking and and there's this line of, of people wearing you know button down van Heusen's and and you know is like the revenge of the nerds and i said they must be waiting in line to get the iphone and they were these are all these people these computer geeks you know they're standing there waiting to get that iphone and and so they can be the first in line to get a phone that's pretty much the same as the one they're getting rid of it amazes me but it's true what you worship, you sacrifice for. We know that. I was reading something recently that absolutely blew my mind. Blew my mind. I was reading about an auto auction. There was a car for sale there. It was a 1961 Ferrari. It's a 250 GT California. Some of you know what that is. And somebody bought this car at an auction. For ten million eight hundred ninety four thousand four hundred dollars. I'll let that settle for a minute. Ten million almost eleven million dollars for a car that they're not gonna drive. You know they're not gonna drive it. What would you do if you had eleven million dollar car? Would you pull up in front of Safeways for some groceries? Think about it. You go to the Home Depot and somebody their cart is just weaving in and out of traffic till he hits your door. How would you feel if you had an $11 million car and some mama who is distracted by her kids swings that door open and puts a dent in your car? This guy's not going to drive the car. He's going to put it in his garage. He's going to seal it up. And every once in a while, he's going to wave at it from another room. This is an $11 million car. Unbelievable. 